And this morning, I want to talk with you because there is a, you know, there are certain dates that are significant and important on the church calendar. You know, everybody knows Christmas marks the birth of Jesus Christ. And of course, most people know Good Friday because that day marks the death of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, Easter Sunday morning marks the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These are obviously important and significant days on the church calendar. They're, they're premium. But there's also another date, another day on the church calendar that is often overlooked and is very significant as well and part of the whole gospel story. And that is this Sunday, which is called Ascension Sunday. How many knew that? Did anybody know that other than those who were here Wednesday night and I told you? <laughs> Did anybody know that? That this is, a, there's a couple of you that knew that this was Ascension Sunday. You say, why is that important? Why is that significant? Well, it's often overlooked. Actually, uh, Ascension Sunday marks the, uh, the time of when Christ ascended back into heaven 40 days after the resurrection. So if you do the math, whenever Easter is, 40 days. Now that would fall this Thursday. Now, we don't have church on Thursday, and next Sunday's Mother's Day. So today, the Sunday prior, just before prior to, we're having, this is Ascension Sunday. And then in two weeks is another significant date on the church calendar, and that is Pentecost Sunday, which marks 50 days after the resurrection, when the day when the Holy Spirit was outpoured in the upper room. And so... Oftentimes we know Christmas, Good Friday, Easter, but oftentimes we forget about Ascension and we forget about Pentecost. And how many know that is all part of the great story of the gospel and the word of God? And so this morning we're going to put the spotlight on Ascension Sunday and on the Ascension of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1 verse 6 to 11 is going to be our scripture focus to start. When they were together, speaking of Jesus and his disciples and all those who had gathered after the resurrection, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Boy, is that a question people are asking today? Isn't that interesting how we're hearing the same question? Lord, are you going to save Israel? Are you going to step in in all that's going on with us here? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or the season. How many know that's not the answer they wanted and it's not the answer we want today? But listen, it's not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But, even though I'm not going to tell you when it's going to happen and all of that, but I'm going to give you power. Come on, say power. I'm going to give you power after that the Holy Spirit has come up on you and you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And when he had spoken these things, often we read verse 8 about you shall receive power and we don't realize it's linked here to the ascension. When he said these things, the Bible says, the Bible says when he said these things and spoken these, they were looking up, say looking up, and he was lifted up, say lifted up in a cloud, received him out of sight, while they looked up steadfastly into heaven, and he went up, behold, two angels, or two men, it's angels, who were dressed in white apparel, which said, why stand you gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus, which was taken up into heaven, shall also come back in like manner as you see him go up into heaven heaven. Now I want you to notice these words. They were looking up, say looking up. He was lifted up, say lifted up. He went up. They looked up. They were gazing up. He was taken up and the angel said he was going up. Up, up, up. This morning the title of my message on this Ascension Sunday is Live It Up. Live it up. What do I mean by it? Live it up. I mean our life. In other words, I believe that we should live our life in an upward mode. Come on, how many know Jesus was lifted up so we can live up? 
Let me say that again. Jesus was lifted up so that we could live up. How many know there's a lot of things that get us down? There are a lot of things going on in our world today that get you down. I told you how many times I want to throw something at my television, but I don't want to buy another one. There's a lot of stuff that get us down. There are days when we have bad days and we're down, and, and that's human and it's part of life, and we recognize that there's part of it. But how many know Jesus was lifted up so we could live up? The ascension of Jesus Christ today tells us that we can live up even in a down world. Live it up. Live your life upward. Live your life with a mode that where we are lifted up into heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Here's today's big idea for Jesus was lifted up so we can look up, cheer up, and power up. Let me say that again. Jesus was lifted up so that we can look up, say look up. We can cheer up, say cheer up, and we can power up. The other day I was at the hospital, I was visiting someone and I was walking toward the elevator and I happened to notice that the door was open and I started to run to catch the elevator. And as I was running to catch the elevator with the open door, the man that was standing in the doorway was holding the button. And as I got closer, he said to me, are you going up? And I responded to him, is there any other way to go? We smiled, I got on the elevator, and we went up. Can I ask you today, is there any other way to live but up? Come on, listen, I get down, I have bad days. True confession. I have my moments. I'm human, we all are. And there's so much that can get us down. But how many know Jesus wants us to live up, and he was lifted up so that we can live up, so we can look up, cheer up, and power up. Can I ask you this morning what that gentleman asked me in the hospital at the elevator? Are you going up? Are you going up? Which direction is your life going? Down? Or come on, say it with me. Up. What the ascension of Jesus Christ means for us today is we can live our life with a heavenly perspective. A heavenly perspective. We can live our life with a heavenly promise. And we can live our life with a heavenly power. That's what the ascension is all about. You see, the ascension of Jesus Christ is all about getting us a greater revelation of Jesus that is bigger than this life. The ascension is all about us getting a greater hope in Jesus that is beyond this life. And the ascension of Jesus Christ is all about us getting a greater power from Jesus that is the breath that we need to live in this life. The ascension of Jesus is so significant and important to not only the church calendar and the story of Jesus, but it's significant for our life today because he was lifted up so that we can, come on, say it, live up. Now, we're going to look at three parts. I want to break down this passage of the ascension and show you three parts that help us give us three principles for living up. First of all, The astonishment of the people. The astonishment of the people. Acts chapter 1, verse 10 to 11 says, They, speaking of the disciples and the others who gathered, were looking up steadfastly. In other words, they were transfixed. Their attention was was steadfast and focused. How many know they weren't distracted? They weren't looking around. They were focused. 
as they were looking up toward heaven. And the Bible says that he was lifted up and the angels even noticed their attention when he says, why are you gazing up in astonishment? Why are you so amazed and looking, gazing up in astonishment as he went up out of sight? Now, when I read this story again over these past couple of weeks as I was thinking toward this Sunday, this scene kind of brought to my attention something that happened just recently here in the United States. When people all over the country and people from around the world came to the country to gaze up into the sky, come on, and look at the solar eclipse. My wife and I got out on our back patio. She came home from work. We met at lunchtime and, and, and we spent... A little time, we got our glasses on like a lot of people did, and we gazed up into the sky in amazement and, and looking at the, the solar eclipse. And as I thought about this, I, I kind of triggered back to that moment. But I want you to imagine with me this morning being present that day. Just, just use your imagination with me for a moment. We're present at the ascension of Jesus, okay? And... What's interesting to me is that if you just read these verses, how many know you could skim past it and just not really catch the full flavor and the full uh, feel of what was taking place? Think about this for a moment. First of all, this group of people were already pumped up. I just couldn't help but using the word up again. This group of people were pumped up already because of the resurrection. Think about it. They hit a d deep blow when he died, but when he rose again, how many know, they were jazzed up, man. They were excited. Jesus was dead, now he's alive, and they all gathered at the Mount of Olives because we couldn't wait to see what he's going to do next. They were already excited. They are already on fire. They are already pumped up. And then, imagine this. We're standing there with, with these people, with Jesus who just rose from the dead, and imagine this. He starts lifting up from the ground. Now, now listen. I don't care what decade or what generation or what century. Somebody lifting up off the ground. Come on. Now, I know that we see movies and, 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 and technology today and advances. We, we may not appreciate that. But could you imagine living then and seeing someone, he just rose from the dead. Now he starts elevating. Oh, come on. Think about, the, think about this a moment. You're watching him come up off the ground. Now, if that isn't mind-boggling boggling enough, he's risen up, he's lifted up, he starts lifting. Then the Bible says, did you catch this? He went out of sight through the clouds. Now, folks, there was no air balloons, no spaceships. Come on, you can't even get in a, you can't even go up into the clouds without a pressurized airplane. Without, uh, is anybody with me here? Come on, think about this. Think about the, the, the miraculousness of this. Think about, I know we know how wonderful the virgin birth and miraculous that is. We know how wonderful the death and miraculous of Jesus and the wonderful and the greatness of the, the resurrection. But think about this. This is supernatural and miraculous. And the man comes out of the grave. He elevates off the ground. Then he breaks through the atmosphere. I don't know, I'm impressed. And if I was there, I'd be gazing up with my mouth open. Think about that. Just from a, just, listen, just from a human, natural, and scientific perspective, that is amazing. But don't just think about it from a human, natural, scientific perspective. Think about it from a heavenly, supernatural perspective. 
and they were gazing up at the majesty and the deity of Jesus Christ. Not a baby in a manger, not a man weak on the cross, not a man just who came out of the grave, but him who was elevated in the sky. Come on. In all majesty, in all glory, in all grandeur. Mm. Wow. Amazing. Astonishing. His teachings were amazing. He spoke like no others, the Bible said. His miracles were amazing. He did what none others could do. His death was amazing. His resurrection was amazing. Please include his ascension. It was amazing. It was miraculous. It was glorious. Can, can I ask you, has our concept of Jesus become inadequate? You know, I think sometimes we forget or it fades away because of all the stuff that goes on in life, because of all the pressure we're under, because of all the distractions around us, because of the mundane grind of going through. We fail to look up. We fail to see his deity and his majesty every day. And our concept of God, our concept of Jesus can fade over time. Some of us have been Christians a long time. I've been a Christian since I was five years old. And you know I'm nowhere near that anymore. And sometimes we can just read these passages and see these things and think about these things. And our concept of God shrinks. And I love this morning that song that we sang, how we can limit in our minds and deny the majesty. We, we can let all the other stuff drown out the majesty and the deity of who Jesus is. Has our concept of Jesus become inadequate? Is our God too small? As one author wrote many years ago in a little book that's a powerful book. Has our life become mundane and has our faith become boring? We don't serve a boring Jesus. We don't serve a Jesus who just does some things. Listen, this is a Jesus who lifts off off the ground and cuts through the crowds and the atmosphere and touches heaven so we can touch heaven. Amen. What we need today is to look up and get a fresh revelation. Come on. How many could use a, you don't have to raise your hand, because we all need a fresh revelation of the deity and the majesty of Jesus. Listen, if we're going to live up in a down world, how many know we have to look up more? We look around all the time, don't we? We, look at, we know everything that's going on around. We know the news because they play it over and over and over and over. We look at everything. You know what? If we want to live up, if you want to keep looking at all that stuff, you're going to stay down. But if we want to look, if we want to live up, we got to look up more. We have to be amazed with Jesus more. I think we need to don't be offended by this statement, but we need to get our heads out of the sand. We walk around with the weight of the world. And listen, I'm not saying you don't have problems. I have problems. I'm not saying things aren't bad. They are bad. I'm not saying that, 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 that things are not out of control. They are. But we've got to get our head out of the sand. And listen, don't be offended. We need to get our eyes off of our screens for a little while. Oh, come on. I can't get up in the middle of the night sometimes and not check my screen. Now I've learned to just turn it off. We got our heads in the sand. We got our eyes on our screens. When there's amazing things going on and God is at work doing, and we don't even look up to see it. 
The writer of Hebrews tells us how to live up in a down world. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, the Bible says, Let us lay aside every weight. What weight are you carrying today? What burden are you wrestling with? Lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset. What is that sin or that area that just keeps rising up and biting us and keeping us down and holding us back? Let's get those weights and those sins and let's put them at the feet of Jesus. The Bible says, and then let us run this race with patience. Mm, Lord, when are you coming? When are you going to restore Israel? When are you going to right the wrongs? Lord, when are you going to intervene? When are you going to show up? Run the race with patience. How? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, the one who started it and the one who's going to finish it and the one that's in control in the middle of it. Look up. Look up. Don't miss your miracle. Don't miss the beauty and the majesty and the glory. Because we're looking around and we're looking at this and looking at that. Look up to the heavens and look for the miraculous today. Come on, if we don't look for it, if we don't expect it. Last week we talked about urgency and expectancy. It, many of us don't expect anything. No wonder nothing happens. Look up with expectation. Maybe we don't understand it all. Maybe we can't figure it out all. But we can see Jesus. And we can experience the miraculous. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 tells us that since you've been raised with Christ... Set your heart on things above. Where's your heart today? Is it on yesterday? Is it on tomorrow? Is it on this thing? Is it on that thing? Is it on this person or this problem? Would you set your heart on things above? Get a heavenly perspective, a fresh revelation? Where Christ is seated. Where is he? Where did he go up when he went through the clouds, when he broke through the atmosphere? Where did he, he went and sat at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. Look to him. He's the one who's praying for us today. Look to him. Don't look to the left or the right or look back or look forward. Look up. Where Christ is seated at the right. Set your mind. Oh, boy. <laughs> Sometimes our minds are in the... Dare I say it, gutter? Our minds are sometimes in the wrong places, on the wrong things. We wonder why we're bogged down. Get your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when, when, and, and who, when your life appears, we shall appear with him in glory. I got to move quick. The astonishment of the people, first part of the ascension story. Second thing that's significant about the ascension is not only the astonishment of the people, but the pronouncement of the angels. The pronouncement of the angels. Look at verse 10 and 11 again. The angels, it says, behold, there were two men, but it was really angels who were stood in white apparel. They're standing next to them on the Mount of Olives. And they said, the angels say, why stand you here gazing up to heaven? And then they make this pronouncement. They make a, this is a better than a Fox News alert or a CNN news alert. The angels announce, I'm going to give you a news alert. Ready? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, he shall also return in like manner, in the same supernatural and miraculous and glorious way he went up, is the same supernatural and glorious and miraculous way he's coming back, just as you see him go up today. The angels announce his coming back. Rewind to the birth. It was angels who announced his first coming, right? They announced his virgin birth. They announced him coming as the Savior of the world. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. For behold, the angel said, 
to the shepherds in the field, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which is for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What the angels announced at Christ's birth was this. Cheer up! You're living in the dark. They were on the backside of a mountain. They were struggling. They were hurting. It was a dark world. It was a down world. And the angels announced, listen, cheer up. In the midst of this dark and down world, there's hope for this life. A Savior is coming. We fast forward from the birth and the angels announce who's the first coming. And right here at the ascension, right here we see the angels announce His second coming. How many know his second coming, he's not coming as a baby wrapped in a manger? How many know he's not coming back that way? But the Bible says, the angels announce that this same Jesus is coming back to earth and he's coming as the King of Kings. And he's coming as the Lord of Lords. Behold, this same Jesus, this same Jesus that was taken up will return again in the same miraculous and glorious way you see. In other words, the angels said at his birth, cheer up because there's hope for this life. Here at the ascension, the angels are announcing, cheer up, there's hope not only for this life, there's hope beyond this life. Cheer up. Cheer up. Yes, look up. But if we want to live up in a down world, we need to not only look up and have more holy wonder and have some more holy awe and, and worship Him more. Not only do we have to look up with wonder and awe, but also we have to cheer up and recognize that there's hope for today, there's hope for tomorrow, and there's hope for eternity. Because the King is coming. The King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding. And his face, I'm going to see. Come on. The king. The king is coming. This same Jesus is coming back. That was the announcement of those angels that day. That's why the ascension is significant. It gives us the announcement of his coming. Zechariah 14, the prophet said thousands of years ago what the angels announced that day at the ascension. He said in Zechariah 14, 1 to 9, the day of the Lord is coming. Listen to this. Nations will fight against Jerusalem. I think we're close. Well, I don't know when, but we're closer than we were yesterday. Think about it. When's this king coming? When they're fighting against Jerusalem. Notice this. The city will be plundered. The land will be divided. People will be captured in their homes. Ransacked and women and children raped. That's what the Bible says. You could watch that on your news today. Listen, we've got to hear the announcement of the angel. The king's coming. And just like they asked then, are you going to do it now? Are you going to come now? Are you going to restore it now? Maybe he's not coming right this moment, but he's coming soon. And listen, while we don't have to know the time, what we need to know is we need to look up and we need to cheer up and we need to be powered up. It goes on to say, then the Lord is going to come. When you see this stuff happening in Jerusalem... He says, you've got to look up and you better cheer up. You say, how can you cheer up with those atrocities? You cheer up because you know your redemption draws nigh. The day of the Lord is coming when that's going to happen on the earth. And it says, then the Lord is going to come back and fight against those nations. They think they're going to get away with it. The Lord is going to fight against those nations. And we better be on the right side of that. That's my political two cents. And I'm not ashamed to say it. On that day, what day? The day that the angels announced he would come back. On that day, his feet, listen, will stand again on where? The Mount of Olives. Where were they standing on the day of the ascension? On the Mount of Olives. He's coming back to the same spot, the same place, the same Jesus, and the same glorious and supernatural and miraculous way. 
And notice this, when he does that, that mountain, listen, the Mount of Olives, it says, is going to split in two. And there's going to be a great valley. And the Bible says then, that day, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. And listen, and there will be one Lord, and his name shall be the only name. And listen, every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess. Every nation, every tribe, every person. Matthew 24, 3 to 30. Listen, to, look at this. Jesus is sitting with his disciples, guess where? On the Mount of Olives. Boy, that's a significant place. On the Mount of Olives, he's sitting with his disciples. And privately, they said, Lord... What is going to be the sign of the coming of the Lord in the end of the age? And Jesus goes on to say, take heed that no one deceive you. He said, because many will come and say, I'm Christ. False prophets will come to deceive. They're already here. You will hear of wars. Check. Rumors of wars. Check. You'll see nations rising against nations, check. Kingdoms against kingdom, check, check. All these things will come to pass, but the end is not yet. They shall afflict and kill you. They will hate you among all the nations, check. Iniquity shall abound, check. The love of many will wax cold, check, check. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. And they, they that endure till the end shall be saved. Those that will keep looking up and cheer up will endure till the end shall be saved. Then the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. For as a witness to all nations, then the end shall come. When you see the abomination of desolation, speaking of the Antichrist defiling the temple, as spoken by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place in the temple, then shall the great tribulation come. And after that, you will then see appearing in the clouds and coming back to earth. You will see the Son of Man in the clouds in heaven, and he will come with great power and great glory. Listen, that ascension was the preview of what's going to happen at the coming of the Lord. And listen, all of that can scare us, all of that can trouble us, all of that can confuse us, all of that can deceive us. And Jesus said, don't be confused, don't be troubled. You endure till the end, you trust God, you look up, you cheer up, you trust what I'm telling you, you believe the word of God, and you look up and you know that I will return. But be ready. We know we got to be ready. I know people want God to step in, but when he does, they're going to be shocked. We need to be ready. Titus 2, 11 to 13 says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, living soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. What should we do be before he comes? We should live properly and godly and righteously in this present world. But how should we look? Not only should we live that way, we should be looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. We need to keep one eye on this earth and live right, and we need to keep the other eye looking to the heavens for, and be ready for when he comes. That's how you live up in a down world. Stop listening to all the voices. Come on. Stop listening to all the experts and the media, the social media. Stop listening to the false prophets telling you when and this and that. Listen to the word of God. Know and believe the word of God. We don't know the time and season, but we know he's coming back and we need to be ready. Not be troubled, not deceived. We need to live godly and right looking to him. Stop leaning to our own understanding and hear and heed the words of Jesus. Listen, we need to get into the word of God and we need to get the word of God in us. Jesus himself said in Luke 21, 28, when you see these things begin to happen, can we say 
even though we don't know when that it has begun to happen? Come on. You can't look at what's going on and say it hasn't at least begun to happen. I don't know how close we are, but I'll tell you one thing. It's begun. It's at least in the process. And he said, when you see these things begin to come, look up. But not only look up, lift up your head. Get your head out of the sand. Get your head out of all this other junk. And get your eyes on Jesus and cheer up. Don't hang down in fear and despair. Don't be troubled or deceived. Cheer up for your redemption draws nigh. John 16, these things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, cheer up, for I have overcome the world. I've got to go fast. Boy, I love this ascension. The astonishment of the people, the pronouncement of the angels. There's something even better something just as good. It's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says in verse 6 to 8. We forget those verses just before it, which we read, which lead right into it. They ask, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom? Are you going to right all the wrongs? Are you going to take us out of this big, bad old world? I mean, you know, there's people asking that. Lord, are you going to take us out of this big, bad old world? No, we're still here for a reason. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know when the time or season. But what I will do, even though I'm not going to restore all right, right now, I'm not going to restore all wrongs now and all right now, I'm not going to step in right now, even though you want me to and you think I should, I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to do is I'm going to give you power. I'm going to give you power. When the Holy Spirit comes, I can't help it, up on you. That's what upon means. It's in there, up on you. Tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power. Endued means clothed. It means it comes up out of your spirit and comes on you and clothes you. Up on you. In other words, not only look up and cheer up, but power up. Listen, if we're going to live up, we need to power up. It's time to plug into the charger of the Holy Spirit. It's time to renew our batteries and get stronger in the Lord and in the power of His might. If we're going... To live up, we need to power up. John 14, 16 to 18. If you go back there to Jesus' promise to the disciples then and to us today was this. I will not, I'm going to go away. How many know he was talking about his ascension? I'm going to go away. And when I go away, you're going to be sad, but I'm not going to leave you powerless. I will pray to the Father and he will give you another comforter. Another power source, another person just like me who will be your helper, who will give you power every day. He will abide with you. I can only be with you in one place at one time in a physical body, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to dwell in you and he's going to be with you and he's going to give you power to live your life. Verse 16, chapter 16, verses 7 and 13 says this, and I love this and we miss this oftentimes. Jesus said, it is for your advantage that I go away. What? I mean, no, they didn't want to let go of him. They didn't want him to go up. They didn't want him to leave the earth and go to heaven. He didn't want him to ascend. They wanted to keep him there. After all, he just rose from the dead. This was a great time to capture Rome. Come on. This was a great time to storm the city. This is a great time. You got everybody on your side. Everybody believes now. And Jesus said, no, I'm going to go away. What? He says, but it's for your advantage. What? In life, how many know we need an advantage if we're going to live? In sports, how many know they're always looking for an advantage against the opponent? And how many know the Bible says we need to be smart and wise and we need to be filled with God and the Word and the Spirit of God because lest the enemy get an advantage on us. The enemy doesn't have an advantage because Jesus gave us the ultimate advantage. He said, it is for your advantage that I go away. Why? Because if I don't go, the Holy Spirit won't come. How many know the moment Jesus broke through the clouds, what did God say? Cue the Holy Spirit. And the dove, when Jesus was going up, it was time for the Spirit to come down. 
See, this was happening at the ascension. This was all, this was the turning point. This was the pivot right here. This was the hinge of the door of Pentecost right here. The ascension. If I don't go away, the Spirit won't come. He's going to be your advantage. He will be with you. He will guide you. He will teach you. He will show you the things to come. If we're going to live up, how many know we've got to stop filling up our minds and hearts with the garbage and negativity of this world? Too much garbage, too much negative. Why do you read all that junk on Facebook? Why do you read all that garbage and negativity and nonsense that means nothing? We spend our time looking at all this, listening. Why do we listen? I listen to enough news to stay. But if you could sit there all day, it'll repeat over and over. And you, Oh, my goodness. No wonder we're down. Let's get our, let's stop filling our minds and our hearts with the negativity and garbage of this world and start filling up with the power of God. Start filling up with the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. What did, what did Ephesians 5.18, the Apostle Paul said, be filled and keep being filled. Well, I was filled up in 1942. I don't think anybody, maybe Sister Josie is the only one and Clara who watches, or maybe you guys are the only one that were around in 1942. I don't know. I wasn't there, but close. Well, I got filled up in 1962. I got met, filled up in 1972, 1982, 1992, 2000. I got filled up two days ago. Not enough. You don't drive your car on one tank of gas. You got to keep filling up. And if we don't, we can't live our Christianity on one tank of the Holy Spirit. That's wonderful we were baptized, and we all need to be baptized and, and filled with the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says keep being filled. Keep being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he, the Holy Spirit's power in us, than he that's in this world. I, I got to stop. Here's the bottom line. We'll get to the communion. I, can you tell I'm excited? Can you tell him I really like the ascension? Maybe you'll never forget that that's part of the story. It's not just the birth, not just Good Friday, not just Easter, the ascension. And then two weeks, next week, we're going to honor mothers. But then after that, Pentecost. Oh, boy, don't miss it. We need to power up. Okay, here's the bottom line. Put it up so I can read it. Uh, Daniel, put it up for me so I can read it. Stephen, thank you. I don't want to look at my notes. I'm going to read it right off the screen. The more we look up, the more we will see the glory of God. The more we cheer up, the more we will discover the goodness of God. And the more we power up, the more we will experience the greatness of God. I think that says it all. Let's bow our heads.